Well, good day to you all. God bless you. And thank you for joining us for this installment of the Adult Sunday School class. We are in a book called Authentic Christianity, and uh, we are in chapter 8 of that book. Chapter 8 is entitled Sanctification and the Christian Life. And, you know, sanctification is one of those words where uh, sometimes when I hear it, maybe when you hear it, it doesn't have the most positive ring to it, sanctification. It sounds like a long, hard, arduous process laden with all kinds of effort. Very difficult to do if you succeeded it at all. At least maybe it has that kind of sound to it in your ears. But uh, we're going to talk about sanctification today, and I want to start with a verse that will automatically free us up a little bit in our assumptions of what today's class is about. And it comes from the Gospel of John, the words of Jesus, chapter 8 in the Gospel of John, verse 36, where he says, If the Son sets you free, you shall be free indeed. If the Son sets you free, you shall be free indeed. And when I hear that statement, I think, well, gee, some of the most churched people that I think I've come across in my life seem like uh, not so freed up people. In fact, they seem at times like just the opposite. Uh, and maybe you have a person or two in your mind that uh, comes to mind when I say that, that um, you know, uh, a person who is really sanctified we wouldn't use sanctified and free in the same sentence necessarily to describe them. But I want to couch sanctification in that very term, in terms of freedom. Well, this book starts, uh, the, the chapter starts in an interesting place because chapter 8 begins with this. And this is very up to date and this worldly. Instant is too slow in the world of the internet. Buffering downloads, lagging internet connections, and slow streaming are the source of many modern frustrations. If it takes more than five seconds, then there must be something wrong with the internet con connection. If it takes more than 10 seconds, then it is time to buy a new smartphone. The World Wide Web has provided a way to instantly search a cornucopia of information and download it to your smartphone. It has also made us impatient, impetuous, and insisting that everything be instantly available to us. I wonder if you resonate with that statement very well. That sure sounds like life for us in 2020. On the flip side of that, the concept of slow, slow has become kind of a bad thing. Slow has become anachronistic in our instant culture. In other words, behind the times. Nevertheless, there are some who still value the importance of slow and steady progress that requires patience and perseverance. And then the authors go on to say that sanctification is not an instant process, but a slow process. Justification is instant. Justification is quicker than that. Sanctification is slow. And maybe that's one of the reasons why it's not a particularly popular concept nowadays and you don't hear the word nearly as much as you might think. Sanctification is far from instant. It takes a long time to get somewhere in the sanctification process. In fact, uh, the book describes sanctification as beautifully slow and eventful. And that just doesn't sound very palatable to us, does it? Beautifully slow. What is beautifully slow? How many things in life are beautifully slow? We wouldn't use those two words together maybe in the same sentence in that way. Slow and eventful. Well, that sounds kind of scary. How about instant with guaranteed results without a whole lot of drama? That sounds more appealing to us and that sounds more up to date. But sanctification does not work that way. Sanctification, in fact, is beautifully slow. And I might add, it is eventful. In other words, it happens through the course of our lives. It, it happens through the experiences that we have to live out. Now, freedom is a concept uh, of sanctification that I think is a challenge for us because, once again, 
When we think about being sanctified, we think about being increasingly restricted. And I believe that that comes from some of our American roots, some of our Protestant work ethic, if you will, and maybe some of the religious culture which uh, was in this country from an early point on. Sabbath keeping, for example, was common among Protestants in the United States. In other words, when Sunday rolled around, you went to church, you ate, you did very little more than that. If you wanted some kind of amusement or activity, then you talked about the sermon or you talked about the pastors. Uh, and maybe that, that would be rather entertaining and fun at times. But Sabbath keeping was very important to many, many of the Protestant groups who were in the founding of this country. And then the Lutherans show up. And when the Lutherans showed up, things began to look very different because the Lutherans don't have that same concept of the Sabbath that many other groups do. The Lutherans came, and sure enough, they went to church on Sunday. And then after church, they'd go to the beer garden or else they'd go out and they would play sports. They would have fun with each other. They would eat whatever they wanted. And it seemed to other Protestants do whatever they wanted. And so there was this sort of divide between the Lutherans and the Protestants when it came to what sanctification actually looked like. Now it's very interesting in our history, naturally you might know about the Volstead Act and the onset of prohibition in 1919, which continued until I believe it was 1933. Um, it was the other Protestant groups that really pushed for prohibition. About the only two religious groups of any size in the United States that strenuously objected to prohibiting all usage of alcohol were the Roman Catholics and the Lutherans. And I'm sure that other groups looked at them like, what in the world is wrong with you people? And there was probably plenty of accusation going on. Well, they are not real Christians. Why? Because they don't show the, the, the marks of sanctification that we're looking for. And so I wanna just read for you one verse from scripture which really uh, gives some kind of description to that particular approach to the Christian life, which is restrictive and more or less about keeping rules. And it is Colossians chapter two, verse 21, and it says this. It says, since you died with Christ to the basic principles of this world, why as though you still belonged to it, do you submit to its rules? Now, Probably a lot of commentators are thinking that Paul is talking about the Jewish law here. But I believe that Paul is not only talking about Jewish law, but any sort of legalism that human beings can devise, which tell you this is the route to becoming a righteous person, a good person. And so once again, verse 20, since you died with Christ to the basic principles of this world, why, as though you still belonged to it, do you submit to its rules? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. These are all destined to perish with use because they are based on human commands and teachings. Such regulations indeed have an appearance of wisdom. Mark those words. Such regulations have an appearance of wisdom with their self-imposed worship, their false humility, and their harsh treatment of the body, but they lack any value in restraining sensual indulgence. If there is a more clear condemnation of legalistic righteousness and the legalistic approach to the Christian life anywhere in scripture, then I'd welcome you to find that and share that with me because I think this capsulizes what's wrong with that restrictive way of thinking. Paul says that it has no power to truly transform us and that if it comes to a prohibition of food or drink, well, these things perish with their usage. They're based on human commands, he says, and teachings. And these regulations, while they might look a lot like wisdom, uh, with their false humility, their treatment of the body, um, et cetera, et cetera, lack any value in restraining sensual indulgence. Wow. What a condemnation of that way of thinking. And I want to uh, add to that, that uh, in this passage here, um, 
when it says with their self-imposed worship, a lot of your translations are going to have the words will worship. And that's an interesting phrase in itself, will worship. It's almost like there's a religion of I will do this and I will do that and I will submit to this law. And I'm going it, to, it, it's kind of like white knuckling your way to sanctification. Paul's verdict on that, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. It's of no value in dealing with sensual indulgence. Now, having said that, I want to issue a major, major caveat or uh, word of uh, instruction here. And that is that what is being said here is not that we as Christians, since we live under grace, can go out and do whatever the heck that we want and all rules are by the wayside, and uh, we can pretty much write our own ticket, we can sin it up, we can drink it up, we can sex it up as we want. That's not at all what is being said here. Perish the thought. May it never be. And Paul has extremely strong words for people who think that way in other passages of Scripture, such as Romans chapter 5 and 6. But what he is saying is that in terms of the progress of our sanctification, yes, you can make all kinds of rules for yourself. But very often those rules don't deal with the root of the problem, which goes much, much deeper than behavioral. Behaviorism, as a psychological school of thought, B.F. Skinner, for those of you who uh, may have taken a college course or two in psychology, behaviorism is exactly that, that if you can uh, control by means of conditioned responses a person, then you can transform them. Uh, that's essentially the thought in a nutshell. Paul would take that and throw that out as well. What needs to happen is an inner transformation whereby we can be free. Free. And let's define free. The book has some good pages on this. But free means not that we're free to do whatever the heck we want and write our own rule book. Free means that we are free from addiction, free from being subjected all the time to temptation, free from that necessity to sin. And what I want to recommend to you is two great treatises by Martin Luther on this topic. The first one is called Bondage of the Will. It's one of the most important works of theology ever written. And the second sounds a lot like the bookend to it, The Freedom of the Christian. Those two works, Bondage of the Will and Freedom of the Christian. And essentially what the gist of it is is this, is that the bondage of the will means that as natural beings in our natural sinful state, we really have no choice but to be sinners. We are imprisoned to sin, we're locked into sin, we're dead in our transgressions in sin. And there's no way out of that. And so we are not free to do anything but sin, so to speak. And what happens when a person becomes a Christian is they receive the Holy Spirit. And now all of a sudden, there's a power or force at work in them which regenerates them, causes them to be born again, gives them new life, and in that new life gives them a will and a desire to follow a different path. And not only the will and desire but also empowers them to begin following that new path. That's what happens when a person becomes a Christian, is that they're freed from that bondage to sin, that bondage of the will. Or to put it another way, and I have to credit Pastor Joe with this. Uh, uh, Pastor Joe, I hope I'm getting this right. Please correct me if I'm wrong. But as we look at the human state, let's say starting before the fall, and then after the fall, and then with redemption through Christ, and then in our final state of glorification, we can put it this way. Before the fall, man was certainly able to sin, but more importantly, was able not to sin. After the fall, man was able only to sin, not able to do otherwise. With the redemption of Christ, man is made able to not sin, although he still is able to sin. And in our glorified state in Christ, we are not able to sin. 
So did I get that right? Yes. Able, able to sin, uh, not able to not sin, uh, able to not sin, not able to sin. All right. Thank you. It's so good to be able to phone a friend. So that's what the human state looks like at these four different stages. And what Luther is saying is that we are only able not to sin when we have been redeemed by Christ and have received the Holy Spirit. And then an interesting thing happens. Our will begins to want to cooperate with God. Maybe it doesn't start off very strong, but it starts off nonetheless. And with practice, with application, with the hearing of God's word, with the receiving of his sacraments, that impulse to follow God, to desire the things of God, and to follow in his steps begins to grow and get stronger all the time. And it is in that, it is in that life of following Christ and following his commands and living his way that we find the freedom that we so desperately want. And that is the freedom not to sin, the freedom to do the right thing, the freedom to be the people that we always thought we ought to be but could never quite make it. And now, probably all of us, probably many of you, can relate to the struggle to get to that point. We can relate to what Paul says in Romans chapter 7 when he says, Inwardly I delight in God's law, but the doing is not there. For I delight to, in, in the things of God, I desire to do them, but sin, taking opportunity in the commandment, in the law, comes to light and, and kills me off, kills that desire, kills, kills that ability to follow God. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? And then we hear those wonderful words, Romans chapter 8, verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and of death. And once again, kind of couching this in the terms of our lesson today, uh, we hear that the law of Christ, the law of life in Christ, the life of the Spirit has set you free from the law of sin and death. And automatically we think, well, how come it's not happening in my life now? How come I still struggle so much with this sin and that sin? And how come I still uh, have this temptation in my life? And why do I suffer from that addiction? The reason for that, once again, is that sanctification is slow. Sanctification takes time. And so my pastoral word to you Christians who are struggling with sin and feel like you're not making that, you're not cutting the grade, my advice to you is don't white knuckle it. Don't try to get under the law again and make sanctification happen in your life. Instead, release yourself to the power of the Holy Spirit. Be patient with yourself. Don't beat yourself up that you fall down. Instead, when you fall down, get yourself back up again, dust yourself off, and say, okay, um, Satan didn't get me that time, and I'm following Jesus again. That's the stance of the Christian. We fall down, we get up, we fall down again, we get up again. And this is why Luther gives us this very wonderful and important phrase. In this life, before our glorification, we are simul justus et peccator, which means just and at the same time a sinner. And so we find ourselves going back and forth between those two modes constantly, and it's frustrating, I'll tell you. I know from personal experience, but hang in there and stick with it. Sanctification is, in fact, taking place in your life in the things that you suffer, in the temptations that you have to face, in the problems of life that you feel that you don't have a solution for. And in the real crises of life, what God is doing is he's forming and shaping and growing his very nature in you. And so maybe we should call sanctification Christian formation. I kind of like that term better. 
conformed into the image of Christ. We're going to stop there and we're going to pick it up on Sunday morning, 10 o'clock. Please join us for the Zoom meeting. God bless you and have a wonderful week in the Lord.